When you watch a YouTube channel that does a lot of sound demos, zero views comes to mind, you probably wonder about the extent to which the sound you're hearing is compromised by whatever it is that YouTube does to it. Let's talk about that. So the common assumption is that sound quality changes with the resolution at which you watch the video, and up until 2013 this was indeed the case. A 240p video stream would use 64 kilobit per second mp3 compression, while higher definition video streams would rely on AAC compression with bit rates between 128 and 192 kilobits per second. Fast forward to 2019 and YouTube's audio and video streams are completely independent of each other. These days, when you watch a YouTube video, regardless of the resolution, the audio is available as a 126 kilobit per second AAC stream or as a 50 to 165 kilobit per second Opus stream, and the specific bitrate is determined by the network traffic and by the device you're using. So I wanted to get some perspective on what this actually means for anyone on the receiving end. What can you reasonably expect in terms of sound quality when somebody uploads a YouTube video in which they want you to listen to something? So here's what I've come up with as a test. This is a 24-bit 96 kilohertz stereo sound file. A bit of an overkill for YouTube, but we do want the scale to exceed whatever it is we're measuring. So we begin with a slow frequency sweep from 1Hz all the way up to the Nyquist frequency for the sampling rate, which is 48kHz. This should give us some insight into the range of frequencies that actually make it onto the audio track of a processed YouTube video. We'll follow that up with some wideband noise for a spectral view of pretty much the same thing, and we'll do it one channel at a time just to see if there's any crosstalk between the two. Next, we'll check for temporal masking. When a quiet sound occurs just before a loud one, Lossy compression tends to de-emphasize it, so here I've arranged three bursts of pink noise with a tiny sample just ahead of each. 10 milliseconds ahead of the first one, 6 milliseconds ahead of the second one, and 2 milliseconds ahead of the third one. Lastly, we'll examine the extent to which quiet passages as a whole become de-emphasized, which is another place where lossy compression tends to take a toll. So here we have a few bars of a snappy breakbeat that we'll use as our control. and we'll follow that up with a second instance leveled down by 40 decibels. Now if we normalize the second one, it should sound pretty much like the first. And we'll see whether or not that's still the case once YouTube has had its way with it. So with the sound test prepared, I still had to add a video track, in this case just a simple caption, and render it out to a lossless container so that the only compression applied to it would be courtesy of YouTube. I made the upload unlisted, though I'll still share a link to it in this video's description in case anybody wants to follow up. Now then, just to be thorough, I ran three different sets of analyses. First, I re-downloaded the video from YouTube after it's been processed and extracted the sound directly from there. Second, and I captured the sound from a computer with a video playing in a web browser. And third, I captured the sound from a smartphone with a video playing through the YouTube app. As you can see in the two latter tests, I'm using the Tascam DR60D Mark II as my recorder, with the levels set against the sweep, which ended up being the loudest part of the test. So now for the results, starting with the re-downloaded file. Right away, we can see that the frequency sweep falls short of the original 48 kHz. In fact, it looks as though a brick wall filter had been applied right at 16 kHz. The waveform view is especially revealing here, as you can see the sweep just drops out. The sound pulled from the video playing in the web browser, on the other hand, extends up to 20 kHz at the upper end. There's also a shallow taper toward the bottom end, starting at around 20 Hz. Similar story with a smartphone, except with a 16 kHz cutoff along the upper end. Moving on to the wideband, noise test, I'm happy to report that there is no crosstalk between the channels in any of the three samples. Even when normalized, the redownloaded one exhibits perfect digital zero on the channel that isn't playing anything, while the two recorded ones simply reveal a noise floor that's unaffected by anything happening on the opposite channel. I was equally impressed with the lack of temporal masking. In every instance, the tiny sample ahead of the burst retained its shape, and the silent gaps between them remained silent. Last but not least, the quiet passage test. In all three instances, once the the latter sample was regained to match the control, there was quite a bit of noise across the entire spectrum. The sound had definitely lost some of its dynamic sharpness, especially when it came to the browser sample, which sounded downright muddy. So what is the bottom line? Can you rely on the sound quality of a YouTube video for an accurate representation of whatever it is that a content creator intends to share? No, not without a grain of salt. 
or two. Number one, the playback is going to cap off at 16 kHz on certain devices. Near as I've been able to work it out, this happens with AAC streams in an MP4 container. If it's an Opus stream, you may be able to get up to 20 kHz. In either case, always question that last one third octave. Number two, mind the dynamic range. Quiet passages will not be as faithful to the original as the loud ones. That's where you lose most of the detail and gain most of the noise. In the end, whether you're watching a demo or an A-B comparison, the sound should be okay enough to tell the story. Just not a very articulate one. I hope this helps. If so, give this video a like. Don't forget to check out the sound test, link down below. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers!